Hi, Terry Shaneyfeld here for UAB School of Medicine. In this video, I want to give a very broad overview of regression analysis. It's not meant to be an in-depth um, discussion, nor to tell you how to do regression analysis. What I'd like to do is define the different types of regression analysis that exist and talk about why regression analysis is needed. So confounding is distortion of the effect of exposure on the disease by that of a third factor. Now what I mean by exposure is it could be some harmful agent like cigarette smoking and the disease would be lung cancer but it could also be an arm of a study so for example if I'm doing a study on um, cholesterol lowering agents in preventing cardiovascular disease the exposure would be to the cholesterol lowering agent or not the exposure could also be to a new diagnostic test in a diagnostic test study so this is a very generic term now the confounder has to be associated with both the exposure and the disease but not just be a causal link between exposure and disease confounding may cause over or underestimation of the true effect and sometimes it can make effects that don't really exist appear or totally negate effects that really exist and finally, finally this confounding factor must be unequally distributed between the study groups so what that means, let's say I have a study of um, cholesterol-lowering agents and cardiovascular disease. There'll be a group of people on the cholesterol-lowering agent, a group of people not on it. This confounder would have to be higher or lower um, its presence in each of one of those groups. So it has to be unequally distributed. It wouldn't be the same between two groups. There, if it was, it wouldn't be a confounding factor. So let's look at this graphically. Let's say I'm trying to do a study to understand the effect of hormone replacement therapy on cardiovascular disease. There'll be a group of women who are on hormone replacement therapy and a group of women who aren't. And I'm going to follow them and see how many of them develop cardiovascular disease. Well, smoking could potentially be a confounder. We certainly know smoking is related to cardiovascular disease. And it's also likely related to being on hormone replacement therapy. So you could argue either way whether women who smoke might be on hormone replacement therapy or they might not be. But likely if you look at the two groups of women, one on the therapy, one not on it, smoking is going to be unequally distributed between the two. So smoking would be a potential confounder here. It's related to both the outcome and it's related to the exposure, but it's not in any way in this causal pathway from hormone replacement therapy to cardiovascular disease. So this is the Nurses Health Study published in the New England Journal in 1996 and this is table one from it showing the demographics of the women included in the study. Now I blocked out some of it to make it easier to understand but there's a group of women who never used hormones and a group of women who are currently using hormones and these are a variety of um, factors that were measured and I'm just going to highlight some. So if you look here at hypertension there were less women with hypertension who were on hormones than who had never used hormones. Um, smoking was less common in women on hormones than women who weren't on hormones. Multivitamin use more common in women on hormones than women who didn't use hormones. Aspirin use more common in women on hormones than not on hormones. And one of the things you can see here if you look at that is these two groups of women are different. The women on hormones on average are healthier than the women who didn't use hormones. And so you've got to take control of that and to control for it because we're trying to isolate the effect of hormones on cardiovascular disease and if you have all these other differences it may be these other differences that explain cardiovascular disease outcomes and not the hormones so somehow we have to control for these things in our analysis so confounding can be controlled for in two different components of a study it can be controlled for in the design phase or in the analysis phase in the design phase, we could do these four things, randomization, restriction, matching, or stratification to help control for confounders. I put randomization here in italics because it's the most powerful way to control for confounders. It's why we prefer randomized controlled trials for therapy over observational studies. Randomization is so powerful at controlling confounders, even ones we don't measure. That's the true benefit of randomization is things we didn't even know about where potential confounders will be equally distributed between the two groups. Restriction means that I don't allow a certain factor into my study. So for example, I can make my study totally about non-smoke, totally including only non-smokers. Therefore, tobacco use 
has been restricted, it's not going to be a confounder. Matching, if I have a 60-year-old smoker in one arm of a study, I put a 60-year-old smoker in the other arm of a study, and therefore smoking is controlled for. In stratification, I break my study into various strata, say 60 to 70-year-olds, 70 to 80-year-olds, 80 to 90-year-olds, and within each of those strata, the ages will be controlled for. Finally, in the analysis phase, I could do stratified analysis, much like doing separate analysis in each of those age groups. And then what's most commonly used is multivariable analysis, which is what we're going to talk about for the remainder of this lecture. Now, commonly, you'll see multiple things done. So if you look at randomized control trials, often you'll see a stratified randomization done and multivariable analysis done in that study. So you can use combinations of these things. So let's talk about multivariable regression analysis. And these are just a variety of statistical techniques to control for multiple confounders at the same time. It comes in a variety of flavors and it depends on the outcome. So if your outcome is continuous, like blood pressure, you would use linear regression analysis. If your outcome is dichotomous, a yes-no outcome, you have a stroke or you didn't, you have diabetes or you don't, you would use logistic regression analysis. And if you have a time to event, like time to remission, time to death, and using survival analysis, you will see Cox proportional hazards analysis done. So a variety of techniques, it all depends on what your outcome is for the wording that's used. So let's look at an example. So <clears throat> this graph shows an outcome, and we call this the dependent variable because it depends on other things. And down here on the other axis, we have an explanatory or independent variable. And what each of these dots is, is an observation from one person in the study. And you just plot it along this graph. And let's say our, our study here is outcome is final exam scores. And the explanatory va variable is time studying. And you get each student will plot how much time they studied based on their exam score. And what regression analysis tries to do is to explain this relationship between time studied and their exam score. And what linear regression, and I'm going to talk about linear regression because I think it's the easiest to understand and explain of all those other ones, attempts to fit a line like we saw that red line in the previous slide to the data that best explains the relationship between that explanatory variable and our outcome variable. And we remember from high school and college algebra, our old friend y equals mx plus b. This is the formula for a straight line where y is our dependent or outcome variable, m is the slope of the line, x is an independent or explanatory variable, and b is the point where our line crosses the vertical axis. So multivariable regression is used to analyze the effect of multiple explanatory variables simultaneously on the outcome. The relation between the outcome and each of the explanatory variables is adjusted for the effects of all the other variables. So if we relook at our y equals mx plus b, we would have mx1 plus mx2 plus mx3, so on, plus b. And if we look at this as a true outcome and some of the things we might want to control, cardiovascular disease would be our y. And we would have each of the other components that we think are confounders of that relationship on cardiovascular disease. So if we wanted to see the effect of age on cardiovascular disease, the statistical model would look at the relationship between age and cardiovascular disease, controlling for lipids, controlling for hormone replacement therapy, controlling for blood pressure, controlling for smoking, etc. It would analyze the effect of lipids on cardiovascular disease, controlling for age, hormone replacement therapy, etc. So that's what multivariable regression does. It tells you the effect of your intervention or exposures on your outcome, controlling for all these other things that need to be controlled for because each of them could potentially impact the outcome. So I want to finish up on when you read a study and look and see a model, you need to really think about what's been included in that model. And what I'll say is use your clinical judgment. Everything in that model should make sense to you, should be clinically important. If things are missing that you know impact the outcome, you need to be worried. And the authors need to explain to you somewhere in the paper why they didn't include some of variable that you think is clinically important. Now where will you find this information? It tends to be under the figure or a table that they use the, um, the multivariable model in. It often is a footnote or you might have to read the statistics section and look because if you develop a bad model you're going to get a very bad answer. So you want to make sure the author has developed a important 
um, model that makes sense. And this is, requires your clinical judgment. Other things that will be included in the model, if there are other studies that show certain variables are associated with the outcome, they tend to be included and should be included in the model. And then usually the authors develop very simple univariate models, meaning one variable put in to see its effect on the outcome. And those things that are statistically significant should and usually are included in the model. Finally, um, you can put too many things into a model or too few things into a model. There's one rule of 10 you should think about that you should have 10 outcome events for every independent variable included in the model. And the reason is you want to make sure there's enough power um, in the study to look at the effect of all those predictor variables on the outcome. So you don't want a role of chance or having a low power impact the outcome. So you want to make sure that if there are 10 variables in the model that there are at least 100 outcome events. So remember this rule of 10. I hope this video has helped you understand more about regression analysis. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.